Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining me. I'm Tim Laskis, and you're listening to The Tim Laskis Show. This is episode 70. I have a fantastic guest, Marcus Ogden. You probably know him from the NFL. He's played on several different of the big-name teams, and so I can't wait to share his story. But first, some of you out there would love to jump into the podcasting ring and do your own thing, but you don't know where to begin. Head on over to timlaskis.com on the homepage and pick up your free podcast launch cheat sheet show you how to get it off the ground with some easy to follow steps. Also, if you need more assistance, you need some help along the way, and you need to talk to me, I offer podcast coaching. So go to timlaskis.com and go to the coaching page or go to the homepage, pick up your free how to launch a podcast cheat sheet, and you'll be on your way. Hey, don't be bashful. Send me an email, tim at timlaskis.com. Now on to today's guest, who is Marcus Ogden. Woo, Marcus has an incredible, inspiring story that all of you are going to love. He grew up in a single-parent home with a father that really inspired him. He attended Howard University where he played Division I football prior to getting drafted into the NFL in 2003. He played for about five years as an offensive lineman for the Titans, the Bills, the Ravens, and the Jaguars. And then even during the offseason, he he trained, trained, if I could talk, he helped train football players in Europe, both physically and the mental side. Now, after his football career, he went out on his own, started a construction company, and he fell in on hard times. He ended up losing $2 million, and he tells this story. So sit back, get ready, because this is an incredible, incredible interview. I know you're going to enjoy it. Share it with your friends. All right, enjoy. The Tim Lasker Show, in search of entrepreneurial gold. Tim digs deep into the minds of his guests. Entertaining, down-to-earth, and informative. Now, here's your host, Tim Laskus. How you doing, Tim? Hey, I'm doing great. You were telling me just a moment ago that you, you were about to be a pro fisherman instead of going into the NFL. Was that, is that true? Well, about being a pro fisherman, but I will say that I enjoyed fishing, uh, hunting, outdoor, things like that. I'm also a big advocate of uh, sports as far as playing basketball, being active and fit. So by far, I'm a very, you know, exercise driven, health fitness type of guy. That's what I enjoy when not doing my my career. Mm, So you're not a couch potato, I take it. (laughs) No, absolutely not. Uh, you can't you can't stay in great shape being on the couch. So I like to get up, get out, move around, do things where I can keep myself uh, healthy, active, and fit. Absolutely. Well, hey, you know, you, you mentioned fishing. Do you like fishing or catching? I like to I like to catch. I like to catch. <laughs> I def- definitely like to go out. You know, uh, I when I was younger, we used to do a lot of deep sea fishing. Today, I'm more kind of like you know, inner banks kind of guy, or to a stream or a pond where I don't have to worry about going out on a boat or riding long rides out in the water. So I prefer to do stuff like, you know, freshwater fish, bass, you know, you know, trout, stuff like that. I'm a real stay on the land type of guy, but I love to catch fish for sure. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. We, we could probably, I'll have to have you back on. We'll have a fishing uh, show. We'll have a fishing episode. Okay. That'd be cool. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, Marcus, most people know you as a as an NFL, you know, player, and, and you've had quite a, a uh, you know, record of, of playing for many different teams, but currently right now, Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself professionally. What are you working on right now? Tim, I am a motivational public speaker. I speak uh, for all types of clients that would be corporate clients, that would be universities and high schools, that would be motivational talks. I just got through talking to the Buffalo Bills rookie class last week in Orchard Park, New York. I was actually talking to them about financial literacy social media brain and awareness and how to basically be professional thing that they do. I was actually talking to their first round draft pick, Tredavious White out of LSU. Great kid. He doesn't even own a car. He's so scared to, to, to go broke, which is outstanding, by the way. They haven't even bought a car. So I do things like that. I'm also, I also host speaking academies where I help people with three areas, improve communication skills, learn the art of successful networking, how to enhance their brand. We have some great sponsors involved with us, such as Home Depot, New York Life, or Talking to Under Armour, Tom James Custom Suits. Uh, We have a lot of great brands behind us, which helps us to be able to help 
you know, lots of people. But of course, we work with you know, anybody in sales, management, you know, authors, you know, whatever you want to do, or leadership coaches, whatever. But we have a special spot, of course, for athletes and uh, vets. Wow. So it sounds like you're staying pretty busy. And let me ask you about working with some of the new guys who are fresh into the league. And and I'm sure that, you know, initially they're like, yeah, I don't want to buy anything. But then I, I, I'm sure as time goes on, they see other teammates, you know, with the big homes, the, the nice cars and the, the, the sound systems and all that stuff. How difficult is it to kind of fight against that, not not to start splurging real early? It is. It's very hard. I told I, I told them this actually uh, during my talk. I remember I had two teammates. Uh, both were, you know, great football players. You know, both went to SEC schools. They used to spend between eighty to a hundred thousand dollars a week every other week trying to outdo each other with jewelry. And what happens is, Tim, you get caught in that situation I call "keep up with the Joneses," where you are looking to basically try to be something that you're not. Be okay with who you are. Like I told the rookies, if you want to live modestly, be okay with that. No one else is going to pay your bills for you. If you get into financial trouble, it's going to help you out. So you must be the one to set the precedent and say, okay, you know what? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to stay within this budget. This is what I can afford to spend. When I was a rookie, Tim, I had a budget. Now, I bought a car after I made the team. But other than that, I had an apartment. I had bills that were allocated, like my rent, my cable. So I was spending probably about maybe two to twenty five hundred dollars per month on all my bills, my truck payment, my rent from my apartment, all that. I was making after taxes about thirty five grand a month. So I was able to be sure whatever I didn't spend, I would save. So when I got out of the NFL, I had money put away. I just lost mine in a bad business deal. But that's kind of neither here nor there. But like I told the rookies, be okay with who you are. And for goodness sakes, don't try to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah. And did did you have family members just to start calling you that you never knew existed? Of course. And that's the way it always is. I mean, thanks for, like, for me not being a public speaker and becoming very well known at it. You know, I went into Baltimore last week, this past weekend for a speaking job. And people that I hadn't heard from in years, like, cause, you know, like I said, Tim, I went bankrupt in 2013 and I lost everything, home, cars, you name it. Four years later now, I'm actually speaking for a job on the same platform as Howard Schultz, who's the executive chairman of Starbucks. Starbucks did $73 billion of revenue last quarter. So now I'm speaking on the same platform as he is. Now people are like, oh, Marcus, I knew you were going to be successful. Oh, Marcus, you know, let's go out when you're here. Let's go to there and go down and play some, uh, play some poker at the casino. Let's hang out. I miss you, buddy. I'm like, come on, man. Like when I was flat broke coming to town to try to rebuild my life and rebuild my brand and try to fight my bankruptcy and fight off creditors, no one wanted to hang out with me. So I'm tell the guys, you know, family is family, but you're responsible for yourself. You know, if you have, if you have children or, your, or a wife, you're responsible for them. Beyond that, if you want to help your mom and dad, that's fine. But other than that, brothers, cousins, all these other people, they're not your responsibility. The responsibility is on those people to make their own way. So a lot of the rookies understood that. And I'm hopeful that they hurt me so they won't get into that same pitfall of helping out too many band members. Yeah, for sure. What What is some advice that you would have for them to, to be able to say no? Because I think that's, a, you know, there's one thing to think about. Yeah, I don't want to give them any money, but how do I say it without coming across what, as being, you know, mean or rude? What I, or, what I told them, Tim, is to make somebody else in charge of your finances. Now, you never give away power of attorney. Never, ever, ever. But you set up like an accountant that you trust, that you work with, and you put money into an account. And basically, you can let them know that anything over my budget for my bills per month has to be okayed by my accountant. Now, again, never give away power of attorney. But you can make it set up so that your accountant or your financial managers are the ones that cut checks out of your account. And when you do that, you take the money out of your hands and you take the power away from yourself. And by doing that, you can always push off on that other person. Oh, I'm sorry, mom. I'm sorry, you know, brother. I'm sorry, whomever. My, my, my financial plan said, Marcus, you've already spent your budget this month. You have no more allocation unless it's an emergency. And from there, that it takes the, it takes the, it takes the, you know, the meanness or the rudeness off of you and you put it on somebody else. 
Yeah, that's that's a great strategy to do that, and because um, I, I think that's kind of a big part of it is they just don't they don't know how to say no, and and that becomes difficult, and and so of course that takes that takes a lot of you know load off of their shoulders is just to say well I don't right. really deal with that kind of stuff. So, well, you know, Correct. you have such that a way. yeah. Go ahead. Not to know that way you're not responsible for saying no, yes or no. <laughs> right now you're you're also an author. Tell tell the listeners a little bit about the book that that you wrote. My book was called, my book is called, excuse me, Sleepless Nights, the NFL, a Business and a Family. Again, Sleepless Nights, the NFL, a Business and a Family. It's my, it's my best-selling book. It became a bestseller in two days on Amazon. It's my life story. It's my autobiography. It talks about growing up, single parent household, single dad that raised us. It talks about going through the high school, college, the NFL, financial hardships. It talks about all that stuff. And I'm trying to educate people in my business life where I was very successful early on after my NFL career in business. And I lost everything in nine in 90 days to help them not make the same mistakes that I did. What drives me crazy is when people make mistakes, Tim, and then they don't want to talk about it to help others. They just want to say, oh, you know, you learn on your own. Well, yeah, okay, you can do that. But how is society going to get any better? I tell people all the time, knowledge is power, but sharing knowledge is a blessing. Like, what good is it to have the knowledge that you have if you're, not, if you're not sharing with other people? You're wasting your blessing. You're not helping anybody. So I'm a big believer that if you make a mistake or you go bankrupt or you lose everything like I did, it's your duty to help others not walk down your same path. Yeah, and you have such a you know a, a very interesting story and and. You know, one that that can really help other people. I mean, you have a platform to speak to really help change the lives of other people. And I, I wanted to back up a little bit because you talked about growing up in a, in a single, you know, parent home. And you know, what was that like for you as a child? And you know, just having a single parent. And, and what what impact did it have? Having a single father who was responsible for raising me from the time of eight years old to you left, you know, college. I mean, left high school to go to college. It was really good for me because my father and I were exceptionally close and we grew a great bond. When he passed away, it's been almost, it's been, uh, almost 11 years now, yeah, a part of me died. Now, I've got that part of myself back because I learned that you know my dad didn't want me to spend the rest of my life feeling sorry for myself that he's not here. But my dad was a big believer in financial literacy. He was a big believer in treating women with, with respect treating others with respect and also being a professional at all times, but beyond, I'm sorry, but above everything else, Tim, education was number one, plain and simple. His boys were going to be educated before being great football players. So having a single parent for me was fantastic. No complaints whatsoever. Um, but what he did to help me as far as become a better man, I, I just can't thank him enough for it. And um, I'm trying to raise my daughters same respect of education and treating others with that you want to be treated. Well, it sounds like he was such a, a great person and, and, a, and a powerful figure in your life and, and, a, and a role model. And, you know, what was it like for you when, when he passed away? You know, I remember when, when my father passed away a couple of years ago and it just, it pulled the rug out from under me, you know, and I don't think I oh. ever fully recovered. What was it like for you? It's the same thing. You ne it, it never gets easier I'm sorry, it, it, it gets easier, but it's never easy. My dad's been gone for 11 years, and he was gone way before his time. He was only 50, 57. So for me, losing that best friend at such a young age, I was only 25, was very, very difficult. So what I've learned is that through that process, I've learned to kind of have to rely on myself when times got hard because I didn't have anybody. I wasn't married at the time. I had no kids. So it became, I became a little more independent, but still losing that figure that's so strong in your life for so many years at such a early, unexpected way is very hard to recover from. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and I believe in your book, you, you talk about you know, dealing with, with addiction, with alcohol and, and gambling. And what did that yes, come sir. around the time that your father passed away or, or after the Absolutely. business? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It was both. Yeah. It was after my father passed away and after I lost everything in business. Gambling was more alcohol and gambling together was when my dad passed away. 
when I lost everything in business, I had no money. So it was just alcohol. <laughs> yeah. What what were you gambling on? Were you going to the casino or was it like? Of course, I was a, I was a poker player. I would stay days at a time playing poker, you know, in poker halls and seedy places and places that weren't safe. Because at the end of the day, I didn't really care if I lived or died at that point because I lost everything with my dad. And I was like, wow, he's not here. How can I recover? So I was basically being very risky with my life for no reason because I was mad that he was gone. Then once everything got better and the business got rebuilt, met my wife, I my, my wife now, we met, on, we met on match and we got together. Once that happened and I lost my company, then from there, the alcoholism kicked in because I, I lost everything. I was angry at the world. I was just an angry person in general. I blamed everybody but myself. And now looking back on it, one of my big taglines is I inspire you to, account, to take accountability. Everything happened in business was my fault. I didn't, no one had a gun to my head. I had the wrong business partner. I chose them. You know, I, I worked for a client that took advantage of me. I did the work. So again, you don't want to sit here and start blaming other people because once you start doing that, Tim, society looks, looks at you with a side eye. People that take accountability and actually learn to say, hey, I messed up. Hey, I made a mistake. Hey, it was my fault. It's the, they're a last of a dying breed. So I'm a big believer that if you want to be successful in life, you have to take accountability. If you do something right, but more importantly, do something wrong. That is well said, Marcus. And many people who struggle with addiction, you know, it's it's often of not taking accountability. It's not having, you know, any any kind of insight into what they're doing. It's always everyone else's problem. Oh, you have a problem That's with, right. with my drinking. I don't have a problem. You know, I get right. along just fine. But then here it is. Everyone around them is saying, "Dude, wake up!" Did you have that kind of you know, rock bottom moment. Did you have people around you going, oh, yeah. what oh, the hell are oh, you doing? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, yeah, I blame everybody but myself. And the drinking was never my problem with everybody else around me. Oh, well, you know, adjust to me being an alcoholic or just me being drunk. Oh, you know, it's this, that, and the other. But what happened was when I looked at myself in the mirror, it was probably like late 2007 or 2008. I said, you know, you know, it was late, it was late 2007. I said, if I don't change this, I'm going to be spending the rest of my life like this. And that was the kind of legacy my dad wanted me to leave. And that's the kind of legacy that I want to leave. So I made a change. And slowly but surely got myself together. And it was a process. Then I found my business. And the business was booming. And we were rolling. And I was just, we were the king of Baltimore. We were the, we were the largest minority contract. And I still work for two years. We were crushing it. And then, boom, I took on one bad job, just one. I spent $2 million in 90 days, Tim, and I didn't get paid back by my contractor, and I went bankrupt. So, again, the same thing. I wasn't ready to go bankrupt, and next thing you know, Tim, boom, everything is gone. Right. Well, well just let's gone. back up a little bit. Tell, tell the listeners a little bit about your business. How did you come about to get into construction? Was it residential or commercial? It was commercial. I actually stumbled upon it because Baltimore was lacking in minority contractors at the time. And I ended up taking on that scope of work in the area of concrete. We did very well. I got a business partner wrong partner, but that, that really, I didn't know that at the time. And we started progressing, doing things very well. And then what happened was we took on, we switched from concrete to earthwork. Once we switched to earthwork, we really weren't properly funded for that business. But at that time, we were being thrown into it because the other minority contractors in the, in the city that did dirt work went out of business. I should have took that as a note to probably not do that scope of work. But I was young, impressionable, and I saw dollar signs. So once things start to go well there, we continue to move forward. But again, we just got too big for our britches. We grew too quickly, and we ended up being overextended, underfunded, and understaffed. And eventually... In the, I guess, fall, well, in the winter of 2012 and uh, 2012-2013, it all caught up with us, and 
in less than 90 days, Tim, I spent $2 million. The same order was not paid back by the contractor, and I went belly up. Wow. So, you know, how did you, you manage that? I mean, you, you talked about the alcohol, so you kind of, you know, jump back into alcohol to kind of, you know, oh, my God, now I've got this another horrible thing that's happened in my life. Yeah. I mean, I was just, I was done. I was bummed. I was blaming everybody. I was, I was blaming the contractor, the developer, my partner, my employees, everybody but myself. And then eventually I was like, hold on, man. These people aren't the ones that, that signed off on this. So once I kind of took that perspective, when I got here to Carolina, and it took me like four months, because I moved in a, I moved in April 2013, and I started the bankruptcy process right then and there. I couldn't even pay my bankruptcy off in its entirety. It was, it was $3,300. I couldn't pay off in its entirety. I had to pay off in installments. So then I was on the couch, and my wife said, if you don't get off this couch and stop drinking little lights, you know, you know, 12 pack on a Friday and a Saturday, you know, 12 pack on a Friday and another 12 pack on a Saturday and then go on to work, you know, some dead end job on Monday. If you don't stop this vicious cycle, you will always be right here on this couch, right here being the same person that's not utilizing their story. And so once I got that inspiration, I then decided to move forward and become a public speaker. And then I got met with resistance and people laughed at me and said, you know, stick with football, you know, go coach somewhere in college and that, that, and the other. I said, wait a second, I don't want to go coaching college making, but it's starting out making 30,000 a year, you know what I'm saying? Working like 14, 15 hour days during the season, working another, you know, probably 12 during the off season, you know, never seeing my wife, never seeing my kids, missing them grow up. And then basically putting myself in a position that I could be getting divorced because I'm never home. I'm never around coaches in sports, college, all sports, especially football. I can't say for anything else, but in football have a very, very high divorce rate because they're never home. And that was not going to be my life. So I then said, you know what? I, I coach for a team at uh, Campbell University, the Division One AA football team here in the area. I coach three days a week. This kind of see how I like that. I was really trying to get some, you know, some contacts and kind of, you know, get my network going. And boom, I realized, nope, it's not for me. So I was doing that, and then I said, okay, you know what? I, I, I don't want to work at Merrill Lynch. I was working at Merrill Lynch as well uh, before when I first got here in April 2013. That didn't work out. So I took on the stuff for Campbell. That was kind of a little side job I did. That was fine. It kind of just kind of helped me see that it's not what I wanted to do. And then I decided to want to become a public speaker full time. And again, met with so much resistance, was laughed at, and this, that, and the other. Then I wrote, I seen it like I had become different. I wrote my book, Sleepless Night. It became a bestseller two days later. Once I did that, it kind of helped pave the way. Still had some resistance for about four or five months, give or take. And I got my first paying job in April 2016. And ever since then, I have not turned back. So wow. again, my story is one of highs, lows, highs again, lows, successes, failures, alcoholism, gambling, addiction, um, you know, blaming other people, you know, a, a guy that's just, you know, utilizing his, oh, I'm sorry, who wasn't utilizing his skill set, and which is basically being um, a detriment to society and to himself. And then eventually a guy turned it around, said, you know what, I'm going to make my negative a positive. And I, that's what I've done. And I've spoken so far for six Fortune 500 companies, uh, well, I should see two or Fortune 500, First Citizens Bank and NetApp. Then four are Fortune 100, New York Life Insurance, J.P. Morgan, Cisco, and Siemens. I'm talking to uh, Wells Fargo about working with them. Uh, I'm looking to do a job with Home Depot here in uh, August at their big event, big forum in Atlanta, which would be huge for my brand. I'd say earlier I'm doing a speaking job on the same platform as the executive chairman of Starbucks, Mr. Howard Schultz. I'm doing that job in Raleigh in September. It's called Muster. And honestly, I've just, these speaking academies are now changing lives of people that attend because we're helping them to help themselves. 
Well, it sounds like you found your passion, your calling, and and you you have a powerful story that that is real. Most people have this kind of false idea of of success and 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 power and leadership, and you know it just comes to a lucky few, and they never have any obstacles or no hurdles, and people are you know, quick to try to jump and follow it, and, and then as soon as they have a problem, they jump out and and they just get there and they go themselves. back to work with somebody else. Yeah. Yep, and they go back to and they go back to just living life comfortably, which is fine. But you know what? Steve Harvey has a saying. Actually, it's a video. It's called Jump. You see people going to Monaco and going to you know, Spain or on the French Riviera with their yachts, their boats, this, that, and the other, unless they came from money, were born into it. Now, my brother went to St. Albans, and he went to school with David Marriott Jr., whose father owned the Marriott Hotels. So he went to school with the Rockefellers' great, great, great grandchildren. Different story. Okay, they were born into money. 99% of people are not born into money. So you see them with doing all these lavish vacations, great cars, but you don't see the work that they've done to get there. You don't see the fact, you see Steve Harvey today, yes, but you don't see the fact that he slept in his car for three years. You see The Rock today, but you don't see the fact that he has $7 in his pocket. That's why his company is called Seven Bucks Production. He was down to $7 in 1995. He made $65 million last year alone in 2016. Alone wow. in one year. That's incredible. So again, here's my theory. Everybody wants success. Nobody wants to work for it. Again, I could have quit. I didn't get a paid speaking job, Tim, for two and a half years. Two and a half. I could have easily packed it in and said, this is not worth it. I, I got to do something else. But I kept pushing. I kept pushing. I kept pushing. And then finally, finally, I got my first paid speaking job from Millermont College in Wilmington, North Carolina, at their 100th commencement graduation in uh, Wilmington, in Wilmington, North Carolina. So I went to Wilmington. I got paid fifteen hundred bucks for a half an hour speech. That's Once great. I finished it, people said, "Marcus, you have a story. You are a gifted speaker. Press forward." And I've done it ever since then. Have I had ups and downs on this the last two years since I've been doing this? Last well, since I've been getting paid since for the last about year and a half, almost. Sure, absolutely. But the speaking academy. It's becoming more steadfast. We do two a year. And people now know us as a company that puts on a quality product. If you can do that consistently and you can just map out a plan, because what I do for my – Warren Buffett has a saying. If you're going to be an entrepreneur or you want to be wealthy, you need to have seven streams of income. I do public speaking. I do some, I do some executive uh, – I work with different leadership programs. I do appearances. I, I do podcasting. I have done, you know, uh, you know, I do my speaking academy. We have branding deals, endorsement deals, you name it. So I have my seven streams, but my overall brand is speaking. That's my that's my actual, you know, brand that I do. Or that's my actual, you know, platform. I told the rookies in Buffalo, find your passion outside of football and start to build around it. So once you're done with football, you're not sitting there holding your thumb and waiting for something to happen. You're already being proactive. So when your career is over, you can pursue your passion and become successful. And the rookies loved it. So now, that's me, Tim. That's who I am. And that's kind of, that's what I'm all about. Just a, again, just, I mean, just a great, great story. And if you had entrepreneur, new entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs come up to you and say, Marcus, I want to do, you know, my own thing. I want to work for myself. I want to build my own brand, my own company, but I'm afraid. What would you say to them? Live by these five rules and you should be, you can be successful. Number one, know your business. Number two, if you have a partner, vet that partner in a few bucks to find out about that person, who they are. Always vet and do background checks on your employees. Number four, always be properly funded. Number five, know when to walk away if things get starting to get bad. And then the number one primary thing that you must do well above everything else was two things. Number one, you have to market your business 
And number two, you have to be the best salesperson in your company. I told this the other day to the rookies. I bet you that Bill Gates, you know, he hasn't worked with Microsoft day to day. If Bill Gates had to go sit down at a big board meeting or a big potential sale for Microsoft, he could sell it better than anybody else in that company. Guarantee it. He knows it. He built it. That's his baby. If you're going to own a business, you better be able to sell that business better than anybody else. Because at the end of the day, if you don't sell, you don't eat. Yeah. And they're so looking to you, you. Your employees are looking to you. To, you, you have to sell that vision to them. They, they need to be inspired by you. Absolutely. But if you can't sell better than your employees, you're screwed. Because an employee is going to get a check every week or every two weeks regardless. If you don't sell – as the owner, you don't eat. Yeah, uh, that, that definitely will keep you motivated. Well, Marcus, let's move into the dig round. I'm going to ask you a couple of quick questions, and, and you can reply as you know as fast as you want. What keeps you okay. motivated daily? My family. Now, who do you look up to as a business leader? Tony Robbins. And you have to choose one of these, street smarts or book smarts. For me, for talk about myself. Yeah, which one do you choose? You're, you're faced with a choice. You, you can either choose street smarts or can I book smarts. Can I choose, can I choose both? No, street smart. just one. <laughs> street, street smart. Street smart. Street one. I'm very good at reading people. Yeah, you know what's and interesting. That's what, and that's what sales is. Yeah, you got to understand people. You got to understand the psychology of people, and it's and if you don't, yeah, you know, you're going to be in a in a world of, of pain and a and, lot of trouble, <laughs> and always confused. A lot of trouble. And and even when I ask people this question, who have Ivy League degrees, and you know, and her, her doctors and whatnot, the majority of them always choose street smarts. Everybody, mm-hmm. choose, it, it's 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 an interesting kind of little research study I have going on here. So because book smarts will get you the degree. Both smarts might get you the, will get you the job. Street smarts is going to help you rise to the company. Because at the end of the day, you are not selling to a computer. You're selling to people. And if you are not street smart in the capacity of how to do business, you're done. Yep. Look, at Mark, look, look at Mark Zuckerberger. Great book smarts. But you know what? He's better street smart. He can sell Facebook to anybody. Bill Gates. Steve Jobs. They were all extremely street smart. They were all book smart too, but they were extremely street smart. Yeah, great examples. And, and Marcus, what would you say has been the most fulfilling moment of your entrepreneurial journey to date? Speaking to the Buffalo Bills rookie class last week, being able to pour back into these young athletes that are in the NFL now, my story, so they hopefully don't end up like I did. Like I told them on Wednesday, I don't want anything from you. I don't want your money. All I want with you for also all I want from you guys is a picture at the end of, at the end of my talk. That's it. I don't want an autograph. I'm not a fan. I took a picture to build my brand, not for them to, to be a fan. I told them, if you take nothing else from me, learn my story so you don't end up like I did. It, you must. Did, did you ever find yourself right, as you're talking? And you're looking at them and looking at your, your audience there and seeing yourself and, and reflecting back when you were in their position. Of course. Absolutely. No one ever told our rookie class about their failure. They said, about, oh, we had a tough time in football. How we adjust. Oh, be financially literate. You know, keep your money safe. Oh, you know, women, be careful for women that, you know, that could be if they had HIV. Okay, great. That's fine. And it's not the NFL's fault. It's the fact that we as young we as young people, as young men, weren't being told from a former player that's gone bankrupt exactly how it happened. I believe again, knowledge is power, sharing it is a blessing. It's my job to share my story with as many people as possible to first, you know, feed my family, build my brand, and to get myself to a point where I've, I've become a very stable fit. My dream is to become like Tony Robbins in a, in a perspective. But it's my job, Tim, to tell people exactly how I went bankrupt so they don't do it themselves. Well, Marcus, you have such an inspiring story, and you have an incredibly clear vision of where you're going. And you're on your way to really changing lives of, of people. 
And, so, you know, I'm just, I'm so honored to have you on the show today. And unfortunately, we've come to the end of the show. But before we go, tell the listeners where they can find you online, where they can buy your book and any social media sites that you're on as well. So, so I'm on social media. I'm on Facebook. It's my name spelled out, M-A-R-Q-U-E-S-O-G-D-E-N. My Instagram is at Marcus Ogden. My Twitter is at Marcus underscore Ogden. My Snapchat is M Ogden 71. My LinkedIn is my name spelled out, Marcus Ogden. You can find me uh, on my website, which is www.ogdenspeakingacademy.com. We're actually rebuilding a new one, but that, that's for now. And then we have my other site, which is www.marcusogden.com. Fantastic. And you can buy my book online at Amazon or Boston Nobles online, or you can buy it off my website, off my Marcus Ogden website as well. Perfect. Marcus, you've been a fantastic guest. Thank you very much for your time. And you're not too far away from me. And next time I'm up, up in your neck of the woods, I'll stop by. Maybe we can go have a Starbucks coffee. Sounds good, man. I'll be talking to uh, tell Howard, man. We're going to add a few bucks to their revenue, so that's not a problem at all. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, wonderful. You yeah. have a great rest of your day. Thanks again. And everyone that's listening, be sure to visit Marcus Ogden online and purchase his book. It's fantastic. It'll help change your life. And thanks again. Have a great day. Thanks, Tim. Want more entrepreneurial tips? Go to timlaskus.com.